wasn't never that Zaha's get something and like others just get it at all. When you're 25, like you think like, you know, you're going to take over the world. Of course, that's the spirit like that you want to encourage. Zaha, when she was alive, like she attracted the best talent, but also the most criticism. She shielded all the young people from like the vicious attacks, like in many cases, it, like very vicious, right? Like, and to the extent that like, you know, we had to sue, <laughs> you know, companies and like she had to walk out of BBC interviews and like, so the metaverse is the opportunity in a way for architects to recognize that it's the internet becoming architectural and and like that we can actually contribute significantly to shaping its current form. Hey guys, welcome to another Blessed Dark video and today we are in conversation with Shajay Bhushan. He is an associate director at Zaha Hadid Architects and is the co-founder of Code, which is ZHA's computational design group. In this interview, we will talk about his journey from studying in Delhi in India and going on to becoming an associate director at ZHA. We will also talk about Zaha and what she was like at the company and will also touch upon ZHA's advent into the metaverse. It's an interview packed with a lot of interesting conversation. So without further wait, let's go to Shajay. So welcome Shajay, welcome to uh, the channel and thank you so much for taking out the time on a Sunday evening for this. No, thanks, thanks for the invitation and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so, uh, you know, your journey is something, you know, that I was really, I, I, I read up on it and I was really inspired and I, I wanted to talk, talk to you about it and bring your journey to more people. So mm -hmm. today in this interview, we, we're going to be um, sort of tracing back your steps right from your college days and then to doing what you're doing today. All right, so I actually wanted to start off with uh, going back to your bachelor's degree. So you graduated from the Indraprasth Open University in India with a mm -hmm. bachelor's in architecture. Um, going back to your college days, how was that time? Was the kind of work that you did back then re even remotely close to what you do today? Uh, or was anybody doing that kind of work at that time? So technologically not, but um, I think in terms of critical reflection of architecture and like the role of architecture in society and so on. Yeah, definitely. Because I think more than in the Presta University, it was like the TVB School of Habitat Studies, which was a, you know, experimental school set up in a way to, 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 to be the kind of AA of India, uh, like with a similar ambition to be, you know, democratic first principle based education and, and curriculum was developed on that basis that like, you know, how, what is, what does, what is the role of architecture in modern India and how we can be critically reflective of India's architectural past, its societal role and so on. And, and, and I, I still, to this date, I think I feel very fortunate that like that effort did happen. I mean, it, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, because like it ran into all kinds of political, uh, and bureaucratic issues like uh but like you know the professors at the time like you know whether it's agk menon or ashok lal or like raja Dre or mark warner um I, I i feel like it like that kind of spirit of inquiry like of critical reflection and like not taking anything at face value trying to see both sides of the argument all the time like um and and that kind of scientific rational way to think about societal, uh, social, social and architectural issues. Like, I think that still continues. Um, of course, like technologically, you know, it, it's very hard to predict when you start a school, like what kind of technology you will need or like, you know, because architecture constantly borrows and rubs against so many other disciplines. Like, so the only thing you can ensure in your education is is nurture an inquisitive mind, a critical reflective mind, and a self learning type of mind. And I think to this day, like I I feel grateful and and definitely set my career off on the right path. Like not only mine but many others. Like of of that time, you know, I see that after you graduated, you worked at BS uh, BSB Architecture for two years, and. Uh, this was before doing a master's at the AA. So um, 
what actually made you choose to go to a for further studies at that time i mean i studied like in uh, tvv from 1997 to 2000 so just at the turn of the century so to speak and and it was it was a time of like quite significant change like particularly in 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 that part in india and china and so on like you know like particularly in china and uh and i was working at bsb architecture is like uh, my father's company and i i worked there two years and uh but i i worked there whilst i deferred my admissions like uh, i always thought like i wanted to do a masters like to continue the momentum of education that i received uh, from tvb uh, i just made me a very curious person and uh so to satiate that kind of hunger like I, i always knew i would want to do a master's degree and perhaps even continue to do a phd i looked only at, uh, at the uk and somehow i always felt comfortable at the kind of niche that uk seemed to offer at that time and i, I applied for histories and theories like course like um and for financial reasons we had to defer my admission and in the meantime i discovered the design research lab like and since then i i haven't looked back like because it was just so mysterious and so peculiar and so alien a kind of course at that time first of all it was it said team based and second it said digital and third like <laughs> there were all these people mentioned on the website i had no idea of like and so it was um so that's why i cho- chose to do the design research lab master's degree because i basically didn't know anybody like patrick or theo or brett steel i didn't know who these people were like but whatever they were saying seemed so fresh and counter to anything that i had encountered until then so so it was just like a real leap of faith they seemed to be very positive and enthusiastic and optimistic of of the future and and so yeah that was very attractive particularly at the young age when i had not left india before that so <laughs> yeah a leap of faith that worked out really well um, yeah definitely i think so <laughs> so from 2007 you have been working at zha uh, let's first talk about how you got the job there after the a after the a actually was i mean during the studies like um my my tutor um had already recommended me theo who is now the director of uh, adra he he recommended me for a summer kind of job at like populus uh, it was called hok sport at the time and so after my graduation i went back to populus like and um and then along the way like i went i was thinking of already returning to india and like i went to india to do like a two to three month like kind of c++ course and and but at this around at the same time i met patrick uh, at the bar in the a like all of my friends were already working at zaha and they recommended me to him and like so i and they were thinking of starting a uh, research group and they yeah, i just worked out like in like everything else in my life it just happens over parties or like accidental turns of of uh faith um and so yeah i guess like i was at the right place at the right time you you talked about the the research um uh, a research group being formed in zhs so could you talk about uh, uh when exactly did you guys create the computation and design group at zhs and what exactly does it do you know like the early 2000s in 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 the uk particularly was like a um a a period of you know euphoria in a way like technological euphoria like uh you know the all the millennium projects like foster and partners like did the bridge like and and populus and uh and also foster and partners did the wembley stadium and 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 then also the millennium dome and like you know tons of millennium related projects like so london was like the kind of heart of computation you know was like a lot of buzz between the smart smart geometry group in in foster and partners like and kpf and so on and zadi the architects like you know was was not as well established as it is now but it was quite well known already but like and and they're beginning to have some projects in china 
So there was an increasing need to develop a sustained body of research to, to not only think of the future applications like and to be future proof and always be experimental as, as Zaha intended it to be, but at the same time also execute some of the projects opportunities or apply the research onto the project opportunities that were increasingly becoming available because the company was growing. And, and the company really did take off around 2007, like, you know, Patrick literally hired every graduate out of the DRL, like, and, and, and some more from Vienna and, and Harvard and so on. So yeah, the group was formed in this context uh, where like London was a major hub and, and uh, Zaha was, uh, Zaha Did Architects was getting a lot of projects and there was some momentum building around the company. And, and so it was formed, uh, that's why it was called computation and design, like so to explore uh, not only current application, but future intersections between all the things that design ought to achieve, like objectives of design, social and physical, and all the things that computers can do. So it's not computational design, it is the intersection of computation with design. So. I also, before we talk upon and touch upon your current work, uh, I also wanted to um, just take a moment to also talk about you joined ZHA at the time when Zaha was obviously present. So uh, what was it like to work with her? What was she like? You know, Zahadid and Patrick are like a kind of, like at least to, to, to me, like it, they're inseparable and to, to many, I think, like in, in the company, like, or most people in the company, they're inseparable. Like they were the kind of yin and yang of, of why the company is as successful as it is today. And, and also looking upwards, right? In the sense that it provided opportunity, like to hundreds of people like me and, 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 and that's, and I hardly ever understood how Zaha, through her charisma and, uh, you know, just sheer will <laughs> in many ways and a, and a conviction, like, attracted uh, the best talent in the world. Like, even to, to this day, like, 99, I don't know, like, 95% plus are immigrants like in the company and and uh and they're literally from like 60 70 different 65 plus countries in the world and um and this is happening for the last 20 years at least right and and so that's that's what Zaha was like uh that she set up this massive umbrella and uh, managed to attract like the best talent and with the best talent you can imagine there is also high levels of ego <laughs> Uh, in a positive way, because like you obviously have to believe in something and 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 then also nobody you know that like the, there is no hierarchy in the company like for design decisions, like everything is bottom up, like unlike what might be the public perception there it wasn't never that Zaha sketched something and like others just catted it up like it she created a positive culture of I mean, with Patrick, of course, like then Patrick provided the kind of intellectual framework to think through incorporating technology, think through all the, you know, the, the kind of intuitive innovations that an artist like uh, a mercurial artist like Zaha uh, was producing. Of course, somebody has to reflect on it and say, like, how can we scale this? Like, how can we distribute it to, to uh, uh, how can we communicate this to, to the wider world and to the rest of the company and like how we can grow it from a small atelier into like a 500 plus company, you know, so there's the business side of it, there's the design research side of it, there's the technological investments, like all of these things that need to be nurtured and man managed and so on. So yeah, like that's why I think that Zaha and Patrick together, you know, nurtured this spirit of experimentation and, and bottom up innovation is, is all bottom up and Zaha and Patrick and all the senior people in the company at that time and even now like um, are just people to bounce your ideas off of like and and they will obviously offer sufficient pushback like when you're 25 like you think like you know you're gonna take over the world of course that's the spirit like that you want to encourage but at the same time offer sufficient resistance so that you know, it's a, it's a bit of resistance training, like, like any other athlete, like that's the, the 
spirit and the culture and work ethos of the company. And, and you can imagine Zaha when she was alive, like she attracted the best talent, but also the most criticism. And so she shielded all the young people from like the vicious attacks, like in many cases, it, like very vicious, right? Like, and to the extent that like, you know, we had to sue, you know, companies and like she had to walk out of BBC interviews and like, so um, by being, attracting all the criticism and throwing, uh, growing a very thick skin, like she protected, you know, young people, like, it, it would be otherwise devastating to hear all the things that <laughs> people tend to write about it. Like, uh, I mean, of course, overwhelmingly positive, but like some of it is like so troll, troll like that, you know, like, so we now learn to ignore that. And, um, uh, but when, when I joined the company, it was like, you know, we needed that protection, like, and, and, and Patrick in, in particular protected like the computation and design group like significantly for the first 10 years, I would say like, and that is bearing fruit now that in the last five years, we have like just started contributing exponentially to, to many projects at like massive scale. Right? So. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the newest thing everybody's talking about, which is the metaverse. Uh, and ZH is obviously exploring and creating a lot in the realm of digital and virtual spaces. Every other day, I feel like I hear another news popping up that ZH is trying this or this new uh, digital space or this collaboration. So what do you think a metaverse would mean for the the architect of the future? Well, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting social and technological and economical phenomenon, let's say, right? Like, and so architecture doesn't operate in a vacuum. So, and in fact, it's the opposite of that. Like anything that happens in society influences architecture and vice versa, right? Like, so in that sense, the metaverse not only is not for architect of the future it's also for what it can do now and so firstly if you think of what is a metaverse like it i mean one way to think about it is that it is the internet becoming spatial becoming social becoming a collective synchronous co-located experience right so what do we mean by that like compare this to the current internet where you and I could be on the same website and we wouldn't even know that we are on the same website. So there is no interaction between you and me. And on the other hand, um, and also the websites are not 3D, they're not immersive, they're not spatial. So they're, you're restricted to use the analogy of a web page, uh, even though you call it a website, like it's actually just a web page, meaning there's a menu, there's like, you know, there's pages, there's like, you know, it's very much like a book or a magazine analogy. And uh, whereas the metaverse offers all of that, that the current internet does and makes it social and collective experience. And, and that makes the metaverse very architectural, right? Like, because which profession deals with a simultaneous co-located social experience? It's, it's architecture is basically that, right? Like you are framing social interactions, right? That you're creating, you, you're creating your spaces so that people can do what they want to do within, within them. So the metaverse is the opportunity in a way for architects to recognize that it's the internet becoming architectural and, and like that we can actually contribute significantly to shaping its current form and its future form. Like, I mean, if we miss the, miss the boat, like it will be dictated to us. Like we will miss that opportunity to influence. Uh, we'll miss that opportunity again, basically. Like, because the first time when the internet started, there was already these ideas of like a spatial web. And it's not new. Like there were like these plugins for Netscape, like that was like, you know, it had this VRML language and uh, you know, that there was like this 3D, sense it's just that like the infrastructure uh, wasn't there and like when the internet scaled up like you know it, it took a 2d paradigm whereas uh in reality it architecture could like now is again 
opportunity that the technologies are maturing and we can make the internet architectural. So, so there's definitely a um, role for architecture uh, today to, to make, make the internet experience beyond a gaming experience, beyond the entertainment experience, which is what currently it is headed towards. Uh, that it can be art and cultural and uh, social. And it's also not just like something that you experience by wearing a headset, right? It's not like escapist in that sense. It's, it could actually, we could channel all the enthusiasm, all the technology, all the energy in the metaverse and blockchain space to change the physical world. Because the metaverse highlights one of the key factors of what architecture should be. It should be about keeping the user engaged, um, keeping them, it, it's in the service of the user. And particularly on the internet, if your architecture or your experience is not engaging, they will just leave, right? They can, unlike in a physical city you're, where it's very hard for you to leave a physical city, in the internet, like you can just go to another experience. And, and that highlights the fact that the architecture has to be engaging and productive, not only entertaining. Like, so imagine you go to a website to get something done, right? Like, and so the metaverse should be, it should help you do stuff, whether to have a social meeting, whether to do business, whether to do education, whether to do, uh, you know, exploring of unknown territories, like whatever, like, that that is what the metaverse is and it can learn a lot from architecture because that's what architecture has been doing in the physical world there's been a lot of trial and error like some things that work and things that don't work like all the sectional tricks that like architects have learned how to arrange buildings how to create plazas how to create like entrance experiences like you know like all of these things have been discovered societally uh, or in, by the discipline of architecture, which can, can lend to the positive experience of the metaverse and vice versa, right? Like metaverse is a space of experimentation. You can easily experiment virtually like a lot of things like um, and trial and error can be faster. And eventually some of it can be physically realized. And, and so I think in, in all these ways, like our, there's a deep synergy between the metropolis to the metaverse and back uh, where you know you that yeah it can be cyber physical and like one can influence and improve the other um, so that's that's why we are so excited by it like it's it's not so much that we want to just jump onto the bandwagon it's 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 to make the internet architectural so. i remember when i was also interviewing patrick and asking him about the metaverse uh, it also got him really excited and he was talking about the different possibilities that it does offer. Um, so yeah, that is that is actually great to hear. Even it comes out even when you guys are discussing it. Before we end this interview, I actually lastly wanted to ask you like um, a lot of what you do is about exploration and, and experimentation. So a lot of students from India have such ambitions of working at companies like ZHA and doing the kind of work that you do. Uh, and expanding the scope of what architecture can mean. So what would be your advice to these students as someone who has been down that path? Yeah, I would, I would say, you know, like, first of all, yeah, it, it, it's to think about, you know, architecture as, as no different from uh, other uh, uh, professions and disciplines that it's somehow it's always in the service of society, right? That, you know, that we want to participate and we are in, influenced by societal progress. So we need to, to configure or whatever work that we do, like is, 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 in, <clears throat> is in that context. And the other thing is that, you know, it, it's, it's not research for the sake of research or it's not experimentation for the sake of experimentation. It's, it's to say, you know, what can we offer to society? Like, that it wants or that it can is of value right and how do you create something of value to society like rather than think of architecture as or you know just working for a big company like uh, to be able to do big projects and like um, is, is like how can we use 
whatever environment, whatever uh, opportunities we have to, to contribute something, create something of value to society, what is the unique thing that you can do, right? That like, you know, you have to find a niche that is suited to your background, to your interests. And uh, rather than say like, okay, these are the areas that like seem to be currently popular, like I'm going to jump onto it. And, you know, like if it's popular today, you already missed it, <laughs> right? Like, so... Uh, it, it, it's kind of, it's better to think of finding a niche, however obscure it sounds like, but like with the, with the motivation to create something of value to society, right? And, um, and, and that's what I would say, uh, you know, how you would end up working for in any profession, including architecture, like for the best in the world is, is, is that you bring a unique conviction. Uh, a unique belief that that you want to create that you will learn uh, quickly but at the same time that uh, any investment that people make in you that society makes in you you will uh, we will you will double it or you will return it with significant more that's actually a brilliant um, piece of advice uh, and thank you so much Ajay thank you so much for taking out the time for this interview and uh, you know just, just sharing your journey with us no oh, pleasure thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, hope, hope to meet you and you that was it you guys that was the conversation with Shajay our conversation was actually longer than this and you can find the rest of it on Patreon or on channel memberships page on YouTube. In the rest of the conversation, we go deeper into AADRL and code and what exactly happens in each of these. If you would like to support this channel and such conversations, you can do so via Patreon, channel memberships or PayPal. You can find the links in the description below. And that was it. Do not forget to give this video a thumbs up, to share this video and to subscribe to Bless Dark. I will see you soon with more such content. Until then, bye-bye.